I'm Calm Homechuk. I work with Pagoda Port Novelli, who are a communications consultancy. I'm sure you've all worked with different public affairs PR people before in the past. So for the last year, we've been working with BISA on, you know, actually the, the challenges that you have as BISA members and kind of accessing the Scottish market, given the change in procurement process in Scotland. The Excel was created based on the 2006 review and um, film review report. What I wanted to do was just Okay, can you set the scene? I know you all know this, but I just you know give a bit more detail about some of the challenges we faced, what the progress that we have made, but also some of the clear outstanding issues that are still remain. I think you know actually, as you know yourself, almost communicating the challenges is a, a success in itself, let alone actually having somebody address the issues. But I want to take you through what we've actually achieved, what I think are the outstanding areas of priority for BISA and members, and then really get your feedback on where BISA should prioritise, if it chooses to prioritise its activity in Scotland, what, it, what should we actually do? And there's a few different strands that are worthwhile, but obviously time resources are you know, finite. Where do you want to kind of focus your time? So, Scotland Excel framework. I think from the first thing, some of you may be on the framework as it exists already. I'm, I'm not sure, some of you may not be. We always came from this point that we weren't ever looking to undermine the framework as is. We recognise and BSA recognise that framework as a whole has real benefits uh, and ad you know, advantages to local authorities and schools. You, know, you can really get real efficiencies in procurement and a lot of BISA members benefit from that. So we, we were very clear we weren't looking to undermine the whole principle of the framework. There's real benefits to that. And I've said there, so I think the framework itself is worth £70 million to local authorities and the, the saving, I think, from that, you know, Build, building everything together, you know, efficiencies are around a million pounds a year that were achieved by us. So there were, there were real financial savings, and we're very clear now. Didn't want to undermine the framework. However, I think we're also very clear that there were inherent problems with a kind of with a, a four-year fixed framework, which was set in one moment in time and doesn't, you know, doesn't respond to change in environment over that period. I suppose that the nature of a kind of large framework, I think as well, the framework used to be in multiple lots that have all essentially been sort of compiled together. Ultimately, that is going to favour larger suppliers. Um, you, that's just going to be a benefit. If you're able to supply more goods, you're going to have a better chance of getting on that four-year framework in the first instance. Um, the fact that it's a four-year framework undoubtedly means that it's fixed, I'm saying it's fixed in time. So when that, the, the current framework came online and April 2013, they were the goods that were required at that point. It doesn't really reflect the changing needs of Scottish pupils and teachers over that time until we get to another framework review. Ultimately, because it is a bulk procurement framework, you're not going to find the kind of specialist products and uh, services that a lot of schools are meeting for. It's going to be your more generic supplies, your pens, papers, tablets, tables, sports equipment, things that are much easier and kind of bulk supply, but specialist products are going to be much harder to find. One of the other things I found out, didn't know going in at all, and it might be news to yourself, is it's an entirely voluntary system. That was the news to me. The Scotland Excel framework is guidance for local authorities to work towards creating a better environment for buying so they get best value, but it's entirely voluntary. They, they, they all choose to work to it, but no one is compelled to work towards it. And that I think it's quite useful when you're engaging with schools and local authorities. There is no compulsion on this. And the other point, we'll come, I'll come to a little bit more detail later on, is that even within this voluntary arrangement, Scotland Excel, the sort of procurement framework organisation, we're absolutely clear that they do not see, they do not expect all spending to be conducted through a national framework. They're absolutely, from their perspective, recognise there needs to be the scope for local discretion when it comes to local authorities making purchases and indeed have materials that help schools or help local authorities sorry, run what they call mini competitions, so essentially kind of local tendering processes. And I think certainly some of the dialogue I had I mean, with some people from McCann, <laughs> um, some BISA members ahead of starting this work was that understanding clearly wasn't being communicated out to schools. They didn't know what rights they had or what opportunities they had to make kind of in discretionary purchases. But Scotland Excel are absolutely clear that local authorities and schools should be able to make those purchases. So that was that was really that was really significant. I think that what we from that what I took away, I think we took away was actually the policy was sound. You know, we weren't actually looking. We want the the establishment framework recognised had benefits. There was a policy framework or guidance that suggests that 
pushed the local authorities towards discretionary purchases, it was ultimately the practice on the ground that wasn't really keeping up with what was suggested. So it was from that, that point we, we kicked off. Just to kind of further set the scene, because if that wasn't enough, I kind of wanted to sort of draw on kind of some of the key points that we were looking at. Ultimately, we speaking with Caroline, we had a session here last July, kind of tried to distill some of the main points, was what we looked at is the procurement framework as it was and the, the lack of flexibility at a local level was really undermining teacher choice and discretion. I think for us that was quite a key point. You know, teachers are probably the best place to understand what is pupils' needs, particularly the changing needs of their pupils. And actually this fixed framework that wasn't updated either at a national or local level over that period is potentially undermining the attainment of um, Scottish pupils. Some of the, the feedback I had from yourselves was around the, the, the glacial pace of actually trying to make a sale. You know, talking about when you're engaging with one local authority, it could take six to nine months to complete a sale, and then going back to that local authority, a different school and the same authority for the same product would then repeat that whole cycle despite having that kind of approval previously. I mean, if you aren't going to pull out the Scottish market, I can, I'm not sure why at that point, because that, you're, it's costing you money to try to sell to Scottish schools at that point. And obviously, you want to get on the framework. However, that's, that's going to cost you far too much. Um, some of the more interesting things that Caroline and Bisa managed to conduct a survey of Scottish teachers, I think really compelling, was that 45% of teachers were unaware about this right for discretionary purchases. And that's... That is, that's really telling the fact that people, teachers don't know they have that right, let alone know how to navigate the system to actually make that purchase. They didn't even know they had the right to make those discretionary purchases. However, all teachers surveyed, and granted this is only a sample, but all teacher surveys <coughs> w wanted that ability. They recognised it was a very important that they had the ability to buy specialist products that supported their pupils out with the framework. Because you know, you know better than I, teachers are doing that anyway. They're just doing it with their own money rather than going for a framework so long as the value is kind of low enough. So that's, um, so that's probably where we are for a second scene. We decided then, based on that, what would be our kind of communications priorities regarding the engagement? And uh, just to reiterate the point, teacher's discretion for me was one of the absolute critical ones. That's, there's a clear debate in Scotland around the, kind of the, the balance between the autonomy of schools and the control of local authorities. And there's definitely the shift in balance that is moving towards actually the importance of giving more discretion to teachers and head teachers to make the best decisions for pupils. And for us that seemed like a, a, a clear way to align the priorities of BISA regarding procurement policy with that of the Scottish Government point really around pupils with additional support needs. We see increasingly with um, more and more pupils are presenting with additional support needs at school. I mean, I'm absolutely certain it'll be the same across the rest of the UK. However, the lack of access to supplies, what we, our point suggesting was that you know, you're, just, you're undermining the efforts of teacher who, who can see an opportunity to help support pupils who may have learning difficulties if we're not giving them the access to the appropriate tools. Innovation, point I kind of touched upon before very briefly, was that static nature of the framework ultimately is undermining innovation. Now, I'll talk a little bit later about some of the feedback we received from local authorities about what they were doing or weren't doing to incentivise innovation. And the final point, again, aligning with government priorities once more, was looking at the issues of attainment gap. And again, the huge debate in Scotland around how do you narrow that attainment gap between the sort of the highest achieving and the least achieving pupils and obviously we don't want to lower the achievement of those doing the best it's how do we bring people up from the bottom and actually I think the, the debate and discussion around how we can get the best supplies in the school actually is, is a missing part of that debate and that's something we try to pursue. What do we do? So the other point that we actually made was identification of kind of stakeholders in Scotland. That's, as you know yourself, you know, it's great to have messaging, it's great to understand the context, but talking to each other won't actually achieve anything. Who were the, who were the most important people in the Scottish political environment, policy decision makers, who could actually affect the change that we're looking for? And we, we started off speaking to you know, the government and parliamentarians, you know, across parties, researchers, uh, business bodies, and if I'm being honest, I, I think it was hard to probably even communicate some of the issues to them in the first place. They had to get their head around what the procurement framework was and what the challenges were for, for BISA members, let alone actually get into a, a real debate and discussion about you know, 
what a new policy would look like and the challenges. Um, if I'm being honest, it was I just wanted to bang my head against the wall when it came to that. It was that that didn't work. That didn't we didn't get we you know we spoke to key high senior civil servants in procurement, spoke to MSPs. They were they were nodding, they were smiling, but you just knew you, the conversation you had with so many people, they were going to leave that meeting and do nothing about it. And that you know, we had to accept that. However, we had much greater breakthrough when it actually came to engaging at a local authority level. Now I, I said earlier that the guidance from Scotland Excel is that there absolutely should be that right for discretionary pur uh, purchases. And what was really interesting, particularly the kind of West Lothian Council when Caroline and I met with um, the procurement manager there, that understanding amongst the procurement team wasn't actually forthcoming itself. You know, when we talked about this, this, you know, what does your local authority do to actually encourage schools to make their own purchases, we found that in that example was said, no, we work exclusively at the Scotland Excel framework. You can only, we can only provide goods and services from that framework. And it wasn't until you, we got into that di discussion a little bit more that there was a kind of recognition that, oh, well, if, if, well, of course, the schools can make some discretionary purchases. That would be, you know, we need to have that uh, option available to them. Now that. I think it was quite telling that even the procurement managers didn't understand clearly what the policy were, and they themselves were putting, sh were putting shutters down on any approach to actually have any discretionary purchases made. But what did though come out of those three one-to-one -one meetings that Caroline had and I had in February was that each of those local authorities talked about, ultimately they did agree that there was a process for discretionary purchases that were available. and. And a lot of them, they followed fairly similar paths as well. It was a case of either a business manager or a head teacher within a school actually making the approach to the relevant person, either in the procurement or education department, and depending on the value of the contract, they would either approve it, look for more quotes, uh, or send put it out to tender. But there was a defined process to make that purchase, so long as the school could make the case. And that's obviously what that's you know it's crucial is you need that support from the head teacher or from the school about actually the, the value of the product. You know one of the clear qualifications was that this product shouldn't be already available on the framework, and also they would many of them would seek to approach framework suppliers in the first instance, which you know but that's that's a local discretionary issue. If we're kind of focusing on actually the supply of the good, if those qualifications aren't met then absolutely BISA members should have the opportunity to supply this further. However, the kind of real probably breakthrough was when we spoke to the kind of procurement body, Scotland Excel. So we met, Caroline and I met with them last November, December, and we met with the, the head of strategic procurement, who I think was one step down from the chief executive, and the, the, the council lead, the man called um, Council Michael Holmes, um, who's the democratic oversight for Scotland Excel. And that, being honest, <laughs> it went better, actually, in a lot of ways. They understood the issue we're talking about. They, they're the ones who communicated the policy that discretionary purchases are absolutely permissible. They're the ones that communicated that local authorities should be using the framework for between 70 to 90% of their spend only, but that 10 to 30% should absolutely be spent at a local discretion, not necessarily locally within a local authority and local supply chains, but actually that discretion should be made locally depending on the local needs absolutely clear on that and then then made the offer to invite BISA to come and speak to Scotland Excel members about our issues about the kind of, so was actually speak to the heads of procurement actually about what the challenges are which was obviously a great opportunity for us unfortunately we have been tenacious and continually engaging and they have never brought this group together on it. and that's that is a missed opportunity, which is part of the reason why we picked up a lot of these one-to-one -one meetings with the procurement managers, because we weren't getting the traction that we needed with Scotland to Excel to bring all these procurement managers together. Because what we, there's 32 local authorities in Scotland. It's not, certainly not as many as England, but there's a lot. And they are far flung and difficult to get to. And it is a, it's a lot of energy to go around each of them and try and make that case. And what we really wanted to do, we'd made the case to Scotland to Excel, was really wanted to get all 32 in a room and make that pitch, make it clear about what we're looking for, that the policy was fantastic, we just wanted to practice on the ground to reflect that. Now that, that is still a, you know, we're going to come to it later about kind of, you know, future work streams or priorities, but that opportunity to help shape the kind of agendas of these procurement managers for me is absolutely critical. Scotland Excel do have a format, it's called the User and Intelligence Group. For me, that would just be an absolute priority. While we discussed around 
BISA trying to collate and form its own group. I think the credibility for me of Scotland Excel is absolutely crucial to increase credibility to what we're trying to our case. I, you know, we're struggling to get on this group, I think, and we, we, you know, I'll come to it a bit later. We struggled in some, a lot of times getting as many meetings or phone calls with some of these heads of procurement. I think we need the case made by uh, Scotland Excel as partners in this. However, not to be too downhearted, we did actually, Scotland Excel communicated our kind of briefing and um, paper to all the heads of uh, procurement across Scotland, and there is a, there is a dialogue there that pre previously didn't exist before. But the other thing that we wanted to take part of, following those local authority meetings and following the discussions with Scotland Excel, we realised we needed to get a better handle on actually what was happening across the country because it was, you know, that was, that was decent feedback from the three local authorities one to one, but we needed more. So what we did was we wrote to the the remaining 28 authorities. There's 29 other authorities, but two share a procurement service. So there's 28 authorities asking them to take part in a 15-20 you know, minute uh, qualitative survey, qualitative interview to better understand what was happening regarding procurement policy and their authority. We got eight more responses but it's combined with the three that we had was 11. So we got 11 out of 32 which is, is fair. It's not great but it's a fair sample actually and I think what's mostly more interesting is that the the findings were becoming quite uniform. We weren't finding huge discrepancies, and I'll, I'll just touch upon those. And I'm going to go the wrong way here, because I'm going to, go, I'm going to start with the green. Every single one confirmed that discretionary powers exist. So this is, again, it's just reinforcing what we already know, but that was, that was absolutely important. It's crucially important to every local authority, under questioning, absolutely confirmed that they had the power and the policy to allow discretionary purchases made by schools. We asked again also about what percentage of spend was applied locally and that, that information was patchy. We didn't get a huge amount of detail back but where we were able to it was low. You know, we were talking you know, 10, 15, 20 percent. There wasn't, a, there wasn't a significant amount of spend but where they weren't able to give exact figures of discretionary spend they were, you know, they were clear that it was a low figure but they didn't have that available. And as I said before, the, the process was for discretionary spend is slightly different, but fairly similar. You know, a business manager, a head teacher making that approach, either approved or a three different quotes or an open tender. But there was a there was a very similar pattern to each of them, which I think should hopefully give you you confidence about how to make that case and help to guide head teachers or business managers th through that process. When it comes to innovation, it was that, when we look at the yellow traffic light, that, that was a bit much more interesting. There was a very mixed approach. Some said it was the, the responsibility of teachers to understand what educational innovation products look like and report back, you know, which sort of jars with the ability of them to make the purchases, but nonetheless, that was a, a point made. Others said it was the job of officials, local authority officials, which, again, given there's no updating, significant updating of a local framework, this, I'm not sure what is done with this knowledge or information. Others said it was responsibility of Scotland Excel to inform them, but as we know, the lots are only updated every four years, how that information is going to be communicated back. I think ultimately, the, my, my takeaway from this is, they understood the importance of educational innovation and products, but they weren't delivering on it. That's what, that's what, that's what certainly came across from our interviews. And the last point, which is probably the most telling of, of all, which really chimes with that survey that BISA conducted of Scottish teachers last year, was that of those who responded to the question, none of them communicated directly to schools about their rights around making discretionary purchases. Not a single one. They recognised they existed, but they did nothing to actually communicate that back to schools. For me, again, that's a clear area for progress. It's, and when I talked earlier about Scotland Excel being a useful partner regarding speaking to the procurement managers, I think that also is true when it comes to speaking to schools. I think there's a, for being honest, I feel if it would be so ourselves to go and speak to schools, there's a clearly a kind of commercial sense there that would undermine the message, whereas what we need is the kind of credibility of either local authority or Scotland Excel to communicate exactly, you have this right. You, you know, if it would, it just, the commercial priorities of BISA would, I think, would muddy that message. So for me, that's going to be a big priority. That was the findings of the survey. How does this help you? Well, as I kind of talked through before, I think there is a kind of a step-by-step -step process 
essentially you know, make that case, get that buy-in, and give the confidence to the school, teach, the head teacher, the business manager, but actually, no, you have the right to actually make this purchase. You, know, you want it, particularly if it's under a certain threshold, it should be a straightforward process. You will find different levels of resistance, but ultimately, that, the policy is absolutely sound. What I've done there is kind of identified what I think are some ongoing priorities for kind of BESA for the next 6, 12, 18 months. All councils, to me, for me, have to communicate to schools the process for discretionary purchases. That's an absolute. Unless, they, unless head teachers and classroom teachers are aware of that, then you'll never, you're never going to get a progress. You're never going to get that door open. You're never going to, people are going to turn you away because there's no point listening to your pitch because actually I can't do anything about it anyway. That, for me, is the first and foremost thing. That, for me, seems that that should be in a, a concept that kind of guide um, to edu education procurement sent to all Scottish schools. Ideally, and this is a dream, ideally it should be at a kind of local authority level, some f where they could then not only provide that guidance of what you can do, but also a roadmap about who to speak to, contact details, kind of process for different thresholds, you know, the, the, ability, the fact we need three separate quotes. It's... That, I mean, we're asking a lot there, I'm not, I'm not going to lie, you know, it might be looking for a kind of more national approach some, that just sets out the principles, but that's what we certainly want to work to. Other priority for me would be for BSA to take part or host in a kind of another uh, local authority procurement summit, I said summit there, a really round table, I mean something lower, not, not as large as a summit, something more informal, something where you're just sitting in a room with those heads of procurement and kind of thrashing out why is it you're not working to the guidance that is suggested, what are the kind of obstacles? How can we help you overcome them? How can we work with other partners to help address this? I do think personally that the Scotland Excel Forum is the right place for that. But as I said, we are struggling to get that, you know, traction and progressing that right now. But it's still, for me, it still remains an absolute priority. Councils to map the split between national and local spending each year. Again, that for us is for me is a, a way to kind of you know, proxy how successful is this policy being. You know, councils can say, "Oh, we've absolutely put this communication out to schools," but unless we're actually seeing a change in procurement policy, it really means nothing. Actually, we want to see what's the impact on on local spend and how much what the kind of supplies teachers are getting as a consequence. And this one may be a bit of a dream as well, but procurement managers to meet would be so regularly. Every procurement, I mean, Carolyn and I. Uh, and Patrick as well met with a number of procurement managers across Scotland, and it was really useful. And it was, and it helped, I, we really helped communicate the challenges that you're facing in, in accessing markets. But that was a moment in time that we met them, and if less we go back to them later this year or next year, then the priorities and the evolving priorities that if you have in trying to kind of grow the market and ensure schools have the supplies they need are going to dissipate. There needs to be an ongoing process of engagement. So, that's, they're my priorities, and I think for me, there's the, kind of, the ongoing opportunities. So one, I've talked about the UIG, I'm not going to go on too much more, but actually, how do we get representation? How do we get to set the user intelligence group and make that case directly to them? The second opportunity I see is the kind of national debate in Scotland around educational attainment and autonomy for schools and powers to head teachers. Before Brexit, educational attainment was going to be the priority of the Scottish Government and the First Minister made her most senior and her most experienced, her most impressive Minister, the Cabinet Secretary for Education, because she absolutely, her election pitch was absolute educational attainment will be what my government is judged on over the next five years. Brexit has muddied the waters there, but ultimately that was her pitch at the election time. The clear sign from the Scottish Government is they want to give more powers to school. There was a consultation out a couple of weeks ago focused on how we can and, and get head teachers more autonomy. But not anywhere in that document was there any de debate and discussion about kind of procurement. Not a single line, not a single utterance about actually what that kind of power would mean around sort of managing budgets. However, there is an appetite. I met with um, one of the opposition MSPs who is still a councillor actually in Edinburgh. And he, he was bought into the idea. He recognised, actually, there is a, there's a jarring between what the Scottish Government have said on raising the attainment gap and the, the inability to act, transfer kind of significant powers to schools and head teachers to make that decision themselves. Now, what are we looking for? Well, ultimately, we don't actually need national policy change. I'm not actually looking for a legislative change. The policy 
on the ground is absolutely sound. But, as you know yourselves, it helps frame a debate. It doesn't, we're not, what we're looking for is people to discuss and debate actually how we change things for schools and teachers. And ultimately, you, you know yourselves, legislation essentially often repeats what's already happened. You, you will find clauses and amendments put in bills that ultimately don't add anything to what had already really passed, but it's a, it's a signal of importance. And this may not, and this become a kind of prioritise, and this may not be an absolute short-term priority, but actually having the needs, the procurement and the purchasing powers of head teachers and schools included in that debate, I think could be a, a really useful tool to ensure that if, when powers are clearly given to schools, they are retained there. And the last point I want to pick up on was echoing the point right in the beginning around the kind of the value of the Scotland Excel framework and how everything we've done, we have done over the last year has always been meant to, it's never been meant to look to undermine the framework at all. Obviously, some of you may be on it, some may not, or have applied to get on it last year. The framework expires on the 31st of March next year, and a new framework will be in place from the 1st of April next year. Uh, I spoke to Scotland Excel yesterday, and they still don't have a date for the publication of a new kind of framework lot for people to apply to register on. Yeah. Is there at all a possibility that Visa could put in a tender and then therefore sort of represent its members and people can buy from sort of members of Visa? So that as a collective, sort, yeah. a, a collaboration? I'd imagine the procurement process would be quite fixed in a way and they'd want you to be a company with a certain configuration and account and, and you know, BISA itself doesn't trade in that way. I would imagine that would preclude BISA as being a kind of, but you know, for BISA that'd be wonderful. What a, what a membership incentive, you know, join BISA and you have automatic access to the Scotland Excel framework. I think it just addresses some of the issues that you've talked about, about the limitations of the framework, about you know, the fact that it's four years and it doesn't you know, kind of necessarily allow you to sort of you know, roll with the changes, yeah. if you like, but it's obviously our membership body, you know, it's always refreshing, and, you know, as well as your traditional suppliers, it covers so many areas, you know, of procurement, it's yeah. not just fixing one thing. I think that, that would be a, I think that would be a fantastic way to approach it. My, my genuine concern would just be that I think that Scotland Excel, my, my limited experience with them is they kind of over-promised and under-delivered, if I'm being kind of frank about it, and actually, I'm not that kind of quite seismic shift in approach to procurement is probably quite groundbreaking for something that should be out in a couple of weeks' time. And that's the point. This, should, this new framework is supposed to come live at the beginning of April. And actually, the tenders and the lots haven't even been specified and defined. If you're looking at about trying to make that application to hopefully get on that and apply, it's, you, you're, we still don't have that information at hand. Now, that will be. I mean, I spoke to the person yesterday and said that she's hopeful that within a fortnight she will have a timeline. But again, hopeful in a fortnight about a timeline doesn't, you know, I mean, we could be, this is running very, very close to the wire. You know, I, my feeling is it could be late deep autumn before you actually get something significant. It will be, you know, Christmas before we actually see anything meaningful around what's, who's going to be awarded the sort of lots and who'll be in the framework. Despite the work we're trying to do at a local level and try to encourage that flexibility and get f managers to respond to the needs of schools and teachers, I do recognise that you still want to have access to that framework as well because that's where the £70 million you know, market is. That's, that's, you know, that's the jewel in the crown. That, the extra work is absolutely is really important, but that's where you want to get access to. So I, I suppose my point there is there's nothing, unfortunately, to tell you clearly on what's happening there. But let's kind of watch this space. What I want to do then is, I've talked a lot, but I want to know from you that actually, what do you think, based on what I've said, what should be the kind of priority areas for focus for BISA over the next year? Because I, I've got my idea, and I'm pretty obvious about them, but that it, this only works if it's your buy-in and what you want BISA to focus on. It's, well, for us, I think it's all about communications. That's clearly come across. There's this disjointed uh, approach between what is fact and what the schools believe to be fact. Um, so I suppose my, I'll put you on the line here, if communication is the problem, would it be frowned upon for companies to um, activate an independent marketing campaign to actually share that message with schools, would, would Excel, would the you know, Scottish 
procurement team frown upon that. Because it's almost as though, you know, six to 18 months is a long time. Yeah. We're in a catalogue business, as most of us. Um, you know, it's a long time to wait and with an imminent tender. So it's almost like, let's take the ball into our own court and communicate. I think we have been trying to work through Scotland Excel for you know, six, eight months and haven't had the buy-in that we thought we would get. I think, a, an, for me, an, a marketing campaign would almost be doing their job for them, in a, but in a, in, in a genuinely positive way, actually. This is, your, it is their existing policy and the guidance. You know, I've said that it's a voluntary system. They're absolutely clear that there should be discretionary purchases allowed. You're already working to promote that on an individual basis to schools you know, or local authority levels. Coordinating that, I think, would be a strength. My biggest concern would be that it would it'd have a lot more credibility with the buy-in of, of someone like Scotland Excel. Some of the rebuttal might be this is just you're, you know, looking to line your own pockets. You know, this is about, you know, you're not thinking. Whereas actually the confidence that would come from someone like Scotland Excel supporting that would give them say, oh, there is, clearly this is allowed. But I don't, as a, as a concept, no, I think that is absolutely the way we need to go, I just... It wouldn't be forbidden, it wouldn't be like a, you know, absolutely shoot yourself in the... I, oh, I, I don't, I mean, this is, I think you're already doing it at a local level, though. I mean, you're all doing it, you're trying to make that case individually to schools or individually to local authorities, if you uh, have that collective strength to make that campaign, you know, and helping make the case to teachers and other, you know, or families <laughs> about the struggle that, you know, schools are having, to get the right supplies because local authorities have been quite resistant to working to the policies they have. I think it's ideally we want to bring Scotland Excel with us and I think that is important but no I don't I think ultimately you've got a kind of commercial um, focus to have and actually if that's you're not you're not asking for anything big guy you're only asking them to enact the policies that exist already so no I think that would. I was just thinking picking up on your point if you could have some sort of backing from BISA to say that you know as a BISA member there is almost like a, a pre-qualifying criteria that these are, you know, we so are genuine companies yeah. from the UK that are specialists in education, trading successfully. We want to share that expertise, our knowledge with the rest of, you know, the UK Scottish schools. You know, how would BISA feel about endorsing? It is almost like an endorsement. It's also a cape mark, really. Yeah, even just being able to cite the BISA logo as a member. It's almost like a, a pre-sifting. Yeah, I mean that. I mean, I, I obviously I can't. I can't speak to uh, for Bisa on that. But I think anything that adds to your kind of credibility as a kind of commercial company would obviously be useful. I, but I suppose go back to marriage. But I think someone like the local authority or the Scotland Excel as a, or almost actually something like the FSB, who may have that kind of higher profile within certainly the Scottish. They are they are by far the most successful business body or almost campaigning body in Scotland may give that kind of credibility as well. It's, it's uh, I'm torn, I, I recognise the kind of commercial imperative. I think Scotland Excel are just going to have to be a crucial partner in this, if at all possible. Sorry, so did you, did you go to ask? If Visa can't actually, rather than an independent company doing the campaign, if the message came from Visa, would it have more credibility than if it came from an independent company? Yeah, yeah, I think. I th if, if, if not, it might be helpful actually to us as individual companies to at least have some form of, from yourselves and Visa, like an information pack to say, because you, 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 you've given us an assurance that the policy is structured yeah. such that there is discretionary purchases allowed. Well, surely there's a, there's a clause and a reference yeah. in the actual guidance that is there if the yeah. school's there to go and look at it. So what um, you can need is a, a sort of campaign pack or something, something just gives you confidence for that. Exactly. One -to -one so there's, bit, there's bits you can quote, there's sections you can put in that fully appreciate is never going to have as much power as if Scottish Excel. Scotland Excel come out there and say this is what you can do. But it's, it's a step, isn't it? That is, that's available, I think I said earlier that Scotland Excel, their guidance is called this mini competition, strange name, not sure why I do it, but anyway, that's what they call these kind of the discretionary tenders, and that information is absolutely available and can be shared with you all like, after this today and all BISA members, so I think that if that is a priority for BISA to either, you know, help harness a campaign to make the case, it's just a case, it's, I suppose, it's, what does that campaign, you know, on the ground look like? Was well, anyone here going to the Scottish Learning Festival? Yeah. So I think it's about what we can do sort of collectively at that because that's going to be the point where sort of 
teachers and schools are actually going to be looking to purchase and it's then they'll want the reassurances that they can do that without the framework. So it makes sense to do something um, in the build up to that and then something on the day that makes it really visible about how this actually works in, in practice. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I you probably know yourselves that you get, have these discussions with officials and I think they can be well-meaning, but ultimately nobody likes doing anything when it comes to, you know, and the, the civil servant mentality is a kind of conservativeness and actually there's almost, they're running, they're busy with their own priorities and it's difficult to kind of turn the oil tanker and I've always found that the political pressure is one of the great catalysts in government or within local authorities as well and actually if you can have that councillor buy-in, if you can have that government buy-in and support and pressure then that's what might catal which is one of the biggest things that will catalyze change and will get us to the point where some of these this communication is getting out to schools you know and actually it's a some of our answers they're fairly straightforward we're talking about a kind of you know an annual kind of forum where we sit down with the heads of procurement of 30 only 32 scotland does not 32 local authorities to sit down for you know a day once a year to discuss that looking for a document to go to every local authority or every school in Scotland. Again, that's not that many. That may not happen by us asking, but actually with that greater political pressure from the government on Scotland Excel or Scotland Excel on the local authorities, for me that that could ha we could achieve something. But that in itself is only going to bring value if you're able to persuade them to purchase less from the fam framework and more at discretion. I suppose that's back to you as individual members to make that case. The, the, I think the best thing for BISA, or the, the, the role, why well, I see the role of BISA here is to create the environment which you can actually make the, the, the sale now. Instead of you know, spending all your time making the case and then the school or the head teacher was then just coming up against a brick wall and unable to get through that kind of local authority, kind of, you know, where do you actually go to make this kind of um, secure this purchase? But that, I think that, that kind of marketing, that sales, that's your specialty and that's what you're good at. It's in navigating the political waters is what you want Bisa or Pagoda or whoever to make that case for you. But I think, I think we have quite clearly defined roles. You can focus on sales as long as we kind of clear the space so you can actually get that kind of political, you know, the political okay for that. If, if the policy is that they can actually make discretionary purchases, are the guidelines not there as to how they are they, you know, it's different it is different per local authority and that was something that came up in the interviews and the, dis uh, the discussions with the heads of procurement some have a, some have a, you know, a threshold to say any purchase under 500 pounds can be sort of sent through automatically others maybe a thousand pounds they were Others, you know, then the next step was that, you know, three quotes between a thousand and three thousand or a thousand and five thousand. So there, it's not exact. And I think that local authorities would not take kindly, as you'll know yourselves, to being told exactly how to operate their own system. They want to work within their own parameters for deciding what that spend is. But there was a, there was a general pattern of, if, to this. They all followed that a low level will automatically be improved, higher level, few quotes beyond that open tender to see who else can provide it. The one thing that did come up, and I think we have to be quite aware of it, is a concern around fraud. I think that's, that, that was the, you know, when we were getting pushed back on this, it was the concern that actually lots and lots and continually kind of low level purchases could actually come to quite a significant amount of money. And how do we design a system that actually has this ability for local flexibility, but also ensures there isn't going to be just lots of money getting passed through the system without any accountability at all. You know, it wouldn't be on designing someone to say, thousand pound limit, nine hundred and ninety nine pounds, time after time after time. Now, that's not absolutely not beyond the wit of us, the wit of man to actually create a system that catches that. Obviously there could be a collective cap per organisation, per company, per local authority that would actually ensure that you can only make, you know, five thousand pounds worth of sales per local authority per year before it has to go to an open tender. Some of that. So there are definitely safeguards around it, but I think we have to also be aware of the, some of the challenges that would come up when we want to create this new permissive environment. Because I think it is important to continue the momentum. I don't think we can't just leave this and then come back to it four years later when there's a new framework. It has to be a continual process. But is there anything else that people feel this should be a priority for BISA? 
what else would best reflect based on what you've heard? You know, do you want Bisa to continue to have these one-to-one -one meetings? Is that would you want? Is it to be tenacious about this user intelligence group and ensure that you know Caroline's meeting with Scotland Excel once twice a year um, or procurement managers? Because this is I'm not saying this will only work if this reflects what you think will make the biggest impact for you. Is it or is it the national picture? I mean, this is a longer term impact. I absolutely concede. You know, there's a it's a debate and a consultation about legislation and education bill and procurement and purchase power is so far removed from it, despite it being quite an obvious part of the debate. But is that something you want BISA to get involved in and actually try and shape that debate? We talked about endorsement, getting the visa endorsement. So, you know, if you could fight that cause, is some some kind of acknowledgement that visa suppliers actually are recognised educational specialists. Yes, there is a commercial element, yeah. but actually, many many companies have educational specialisms. We're investing in innovation and helping to create curriculum changes, advancement of um, you know best facilities in schools. So there's so much more that gets wrapped around a commercial underlying commercial venture. So really we need you to shout that message and maybe that's how we approach our pitch. Yeah. It's interesting, you've talked quite a lot about what the framework says and the fact that it is discretionary and etc. And that's all well and good and that but that's all theory. That's not what happens in practice right. on the ground. And even if they've got their tell were to say something to all the schools say, you know what you've got discretionary. Each local authority in Scotland is very, very tight in keeping control of overall spend there, and it's about we buy it for everybody. Very, very rarely do schools buy on their own. So I don't think it's just about telling schools. I think there's a, a fear within the, the authorities there that they want to keep control because that keeps their business. They've seen what's happened to the local authorities in England, and they've lost control, and they're vanishing, and people are going. It's, it's not about just getting the schools to understand that they can do things. That won't change things. It's the local authority control that you've got to deal with. I think that's right. I think there are, there are definitely different audiences that you, we need to work at the same time. Um, that, and I think that's probably, I spoke a bit about the kind of political pressure that's you know, in part you know, crucial for us. If you actually have, you know, I'm saying I spoke to MSP and he is um, called Michael Jeremy Balfour and he's writing to the heads of procurement across his region, which is Lothian, so Edinburgh, West Lothian, East Lothian, uh, Middle Lothian. And he's got to write to them and actually ask, you know, why are they not following kind of Scotland Excel guidance or, or how are they meeting that criteria? And it's about how, is he, how can he best put pressure on them so that that change is enacted? But I think you're right, even though we can provide evidence that this is allowed, it's absolutely permitted, the energy for the teachers to be that tenacious and keep making that case that actually this product is essential is where we're going to fall down unless we can actually find the unless the officials within the local government are feeling the kind of the heat from another side. I mean I think so I do I think you're right and I don't underestimate the challenge. But I think it's absolutely possible. I think that we have clear guidance about what is allowed and we can make that case and we can give teachers the confidence and perhaps the way we weren't able to a year ago. Perhaps we weren't able to actually show documentation to teachers and head teachers a year ago exactly this was allowed and this, and this is what you need to show your head procurement. Certainly we have for a very, very few local authorities, but we have certain names and numbers of people within a couple of local authorities who you'd actually who the teachers head teachers should speak to. So there's a there's a bit of a path there already. That needs to be updated, that needs to be broadened out. I mean ideally we want that for all thirty two local authorities. You want to know who the head of procurement or who the head of education is, depending on who they are, who to speak to, what their number, what their email address is. Either you make the case or the head teacher make that case. So that that is absolutely possible, and it's that you know you annoy them till they give in. I mean that, I mean that, and that is that is how Lenny lo lobbying really works. We've got a solid argument. You know, we've got a compelling case. We've got the framework, the policy environment that supports it. We actually just need to bend the will of those who are actually blocking it right now, and that requires just sustained. Engagement. There are lots of creative ways to communicate on a kind of, you know, a more removed way regarding, you know, kind of forums or kind of e briefings or whatever. But that kind of tenaciousness with the kind of one to ones is absolutely crucial. Yeah. Someone mentioned the uh, Scottish Learning Festival. Really, when Visa 
months, you know, they uh, have some engagement there with the local board and uh, purchasing departments and suppliers to help make the case directly to that uh, ourselves. But I know at least in one case, uh, the bigger local authorities there would not even engage with us at all uh, because we're not on the scale itself. But I think that's probably one of the values of BISA actually, as a coordinating body. I mean, you're members of BISA for a reason, it's to give you that collective strength and that voice when it comes to speaking to other organisations. And it's obviously for BISA to collectively decide what, how you want to make best use of the Scottish Learning Festival. But it could be a series of ones. I've never been to the Learning Festival, so I'm not sure what the kind of layout is. I don't know if there's like fringe events or if it's just stalls or if it's just seminars. But it's, I'm sure it's entirely possible for BISA to have a, a very significant role in there and actually create something quite dynamic and exciting to actually draw people in, as well as some of the more kind of grounding kind of one-to-one -one and just getting, making that case. But it's certainly a, a good opportunity to meet with some of the people who are a, a blockage to your kind of commercial ambitions. And I think part of, the, part of the work I feel for the last year has shown that that Caroline, Patrick and I have been doing in Scotland has actually shown that BISA's interest in Scotland and that you can't you can't underplay that actually it show, you know the fact kind of taking time to come and meet and speak and talk through issues actually gives you a huge amount of credibility in a way that probably wasn't really there 12 months ago for being honest and actually building on that with something like a kind of stand at a learning festival could really help support our relation I mean Caroline said at the start you know we made some progress and I do feel we have but there's still a lot to do but it's that, it's, you know, things like that, how Learning Festival, another programme of one-to-ones, really <laughs> working with Scotland Excel and cracking that, um, for me, has got to be the priorities for next year. I think, you know, the, the bigger national lobbying is an interesting one. I think it is interesting. I think there are opportunities, but your resources are finite and you can't, you can't, you, you can't do everything. You know, we certainly can't do everything on behalf of its members in this area all the time. There's, you could work at this all day, every day, but wouldn't this be just time? So we're here um, at the Scottish Learning Festival and we also have a sort of speaker slot, so I don't know if anyone else is in that position, but even just the commitment at the end of everyone's speaker slot to kind of, you know, reinforce the fact that people can sort of, you know, buy our products um, out with the sort of framework, so just, um, you know, just again raising that sort of visibility and awareness of, you know, us, you know, just adding on yeah. as much as possible to this. But you know, I think definitely, you know, but make sure when you're going up there, you plan what you're going to do when you're there in advance. It's not just, you know, stalls can be, they can be useful, but they're also quite passive and you're, you're unless you know the face of someone, it can be difficult to actually speak to the right people. It's actually organising who you want to speak to, who else is going. And if they're not attending the festival, then actually, I'm not sure where it is, probably Edinburgh, Glasgow, Glasgow. You know, there are Glasgow, there are like a dozen local authorities essentially that kind of that circle Glasgow. We could split those who are attending up to go and actually meet with individuals that day. You know, you're and you take off your commercial hat. You're not there on behalf of your individual company. You're there as a BISA representative in a way that you might have better access to them and you're saying that they won't speak to you because of your com commercial uh, focus. Actually, I'm here as a representative of BISA talking on behalf of the sector about the challenges. And that would be a way to, I think, keep some of this work continuing. Can I just ask you to clarify, I'm a little bit confused about whether you're proposing that BISO will organise that on behalf of its members, or you are suggesting that its members should organise meetings and say they are representing... This is just an... I mean, this is... In my, I mean, this is absolutely. Rec this is just a kind of discussion about ideas, as opposed to any clear. I think that BISA has the credibility as an organisation. I think the strength comes from, you know, the BISA name and engagement and building on the work that has been done. And the members who were would be in Scotland at the time could then be the advocates on behalf of BISA for those one-to-one -one meetings. I think the point the gentleman was making was that he struggled to... But would that be on an individual? Because no local authority member is going to go and want, will not want to meet with six different companies. No, I think what we're talking about is we've been doing the advocacy on behalf of yeah. all behalf of members. So that was kind of over the past year, myself and Patrick have been going up and uh, basically kind of a, a road trip with Callum <laughs> to kind of a whole range of different local authorities to meet with the heads of procurement and some of the senior government um, level contacts. So we will continue to do that on behalf of these members. But I think what a great idea is coming out of this is actually we should be having a cross script that comes from BISA about actually, you know, if we've got the contacts for the local authorities now, 
and when you're having your own meetings or trying to have meetings anyway, um, whether or not they're successful, having that sort of course script at the end. So obviously you're speaking on behalf of your company, but there can be kind of a couple of paragraphs and actually we're part of BISA, a community of um, educational suppliers that have, you know, a track record of a code of conduct and quality, represent quality. You know, these are some of the issues that cha um, are challenging for us. So it can be, if you like, a postscript to what you're trying to achieve too. Right. Now, I think in reality, the larger meetings are always going to be a, be a BISA representative from the Secretariat will go in. But when you're having meetings at shows, for example, I love the idea of you're doing your thing for your company, but you can actually flag kind of, and we're part of the BISA community, we are quality, you know, you can buy from outside the framework from us where necessary. I think it's my experience at the school teaching at festival has been it's the teachers, and one of your points was it's actually teachers don't know, yeah. so they we can excite them about our products, but they don't feel that they've got the power to buy them, then what's the point of even going in a sense, you yeah, know, so no, I think absolutely. a big part of it is the communication, yes I take, I take on board you that that's up to strategic level, and what I see the opportunity at the Scottish Learning Festival is to sort of persuade teachers that they still have that sort of purchasing power, and to, you know, sort of just to yeah. go through the process that you highlighted with us, with them, so that they're able to go back to their head teachers who then in turn can go back to the local authority. Absolutely. And, you know, just making it clearer for them, I think, is where I feel, you know, we can... No, it does. If you can give them that confidence, you can give them that evidence there and then, you know, it's a, you know, we can cite the, the documentation or the kind of, do or whatever it is from Scotland Excel, local authority guide that actually shows that power exists, then you are breaking through or... And I think just as a sort of membership body, it would be good if that was maybe consistent in how it's presented. Mm -hmm. So if it's maybe just like a sort of, I think somebody else has already said, like a sort of leaflet that kind of just, you know, is you know, branded maybe with BISA, so it's not just Absolutely. that we're pushing it. As, you know, as well, it would need to be each local authority yeah, with some sort of limits on it, so you could say, your local authority, yeah. this is what your that, I mean, yeah, that, yeah. I mean, I think that from, I suppose I think the, the the high level principle would be a useful start. But you're absolutely right that if you had the purchasing limits and you had the the contacts and the named individuals, then actually you're onto something quite quickly there because suddenly when you're speaking to, yeah, you're telling you know uh, Mrs. Thompson, head of blah 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 school, actually speak to you know Stephen Phillips and he was he's the person in the procurement team. That's you know. Instead, it's not this abstract thing about you've got a right, but you need to work it out yourself. Because we have, I think, you know, from our discussions with local authorities, we have partial. I mean, it's not, it was, it's not complete. And you saw from the day we had, we, had, we spoke with you know, 11 out of 32, which is fine, but it's not, it's not complete. And that, you know, it, but it's a beginning, you know, isn't it? And it just, it just requires someone to just put a bit of the work in to build that up. And then suddenly you have a database full of kind of relevant contacts. We all have the the instruction, the guidance that shows that it's permissible, and that gives you something going on at the Scottish Learning Festival that gives you the confidence to speak to any teachers about how they make that purchases. So that yeah, that seems like a, a quite a, a reasonable and actually quite an impactful way forward. Mm, the Learning Festival is in September, so we haven't got a lot of time. We might not get entirely there, but actually. Yeah. Yeah, but we have the you know we have the contact details for every procurement manager in Scotland. Now it's not always that you know sometimes there's someone in the education department running procurement manager, which is where you want you need to split the difference to ensure you're giving the head teachers the exact information they need. But we have got the start of something that's probably quite useful for you to make that case. But I think your point is absolutely right. It's not enough in itself. Just knowing the process and knowing the structure isn't sufficient. You need to have that political will to kind of bend the local authority to actually create a more permissive environment. I mean one of the one of the challenges I we had was maybe kind of giving case studies of where is a really good practice in Scotland? You know, where actually is the most permissive environment where's the most kind of liberal environment where actually they work really well with kind of outside suppliers and we didn't have you know I think what what we wanted to do was show off a case of really good practice and we didn't have that. And that, so that you know that would have been ideal. But let's try and work to make, make perhaps we can work with a local authority to create that and provide an exemplar, you know, about how other local authorities could work towards that approach and see what are the benefits for their pupils. How they, what's teacher feedback on this kind of new environment? Teachers obviously aren't going to be keen to do a huge amount of kind of individual purchasing, but actually we're using where you and where you make the case 
about the value of your following services, they're going to see a huge benefit to that. And I think that would be reflected in any kind of feedback that we get from it. Um, so, I mean, that feels like a kind of action there. I mean, that feels like, you know, a database on and guidance for something for the Scottish Learning Festival for those who are kind of attending that. I mean, I think it's actually said, like, they've not even sort of released what the new kind of framework or whatever else is going to look like. So I think, you know, there's a certain initial phase, and like you said, this is a sort of start yeah. of something rather than, you know, you've met them and that's it. So... Um, I think, you know, hopefully we will also have the opportunity to have some similar kind of updates and yeah, it's maybe right that. Then another then meeting, the framework? Yeah. yeah. No, I think I mean obviously one of the you know I'm currently been trying to I meet mean, again with Hugh Card who we met with last last year. I've been, you know I've seen Carlin in your room. You know, incredibly positive meeting that we had with him, but the kind of follow through hasn't hasn't been there as we as we hoped. But unless we keep it up, we will never get there. You know, actually, we have to get to the point they are, they're so annoyed, and I feel it when I phone them, they're so annoyed at my sound of my voice because they know I'm going to ask the same question again. But there's literally no other way to actually get through. I, need I think equally you want the skills as well. You want the skills, so you know, we really want to buy this and we can't buy it, you know. So you need to kind of create, them, create the demand still. That yeah, which is the, so your role at the level learning level festival. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's part of the challenge, yeah. you know, some of the feedback we have members is that actually lots of members are stopping, don't even bother marketing to Scotland anymore because they have such poor returns because of, uh, and you get to that sort of slightly self um, yeah, prophecy where it's actually teachers then don't realise what they're missing, they actually have fewer routes to sort of finding out about it, innovation and new development, product developments and it's a cycle so it is challenging. Okay so we've got database of key contacts across all local authorities, clear direction about the guidance that shows per, um, discretionary purchases are permissible, continued engagement with Scotland Excel around both the, the, the new framework that's going to come live in April as well as the, you know, the user intelligence group which absolutely I think is key. That, that, is, that is a lot, <laughs> I'm not gonna, that, that, is actually, that is a lot. Um, attendance at the Scottish Learning Festival in itself. Is there anything else, as I don't want you to feel like I'm, and I'm putting words in your mouth, but is there anything else you'd really want to see BISA focus on in Scotland over the next 6, 12, 18 months? You mentioned the user intelligence group. Is that procurement officers from the council? Yes, yes. It just seems like if the name of that group is user intelligence. <laughs> and if you could actually get encourage Scotland Excel to actually perhaps ask for some representation from the users so that features it some of the different councils, um, they would may, may possibly get a more realistic uh, assessment of what schools actually do. I, I think we can um, raise it at the first meeting we attend. Exactly, um, I'd raise that with them myself. Yeah, no, I, I mean, that's a good, that is, no, it's a, it's a fair point. Um, I mean, I'm not sure I would hope that the procurement, head procurement, would have their own mechanisms to get feedback from the schools and the teachers that would then feed back into the overall framework, but... If I'm being honest, I just some of the frameworks are just a very, a very inaccurate representation of the schools are actually one thing, um, and that's been clear from the level of demand and the student experience um, not being on the framework. Yeah. Um, so I think there are some issues there where if they want to form a user and public group, they should actually be, there should be some representation of the users on the group. Yeah. No. No. I, no. I, that's a fair. But I mean, I would say we were offered the opportunity to come and speak to this group in the spring and we're now, you know, late summer and approaching autumn and that, it just, it hasn't come out. And I recognise they are, the the development of the kind of national framework for four years is going to be their priority rather than the continual renewal and examining of tweaking it in the process. But the kind of slippage of procurement, edge procurement coming together to meet in a collective form shows the the lack of prioritisation, I think, around this kind of local discretion and how it changed things in the interim. You know, I think focus on, as I keep saying, a moment in time. We get a lot out. We sent, we get the suppliers agreed, and then it's, it feels maybe unfair. But it feels maybe that it's it's left for four years. And I think the our role, if we had a kind of a standing or a regular representation within the UIG, would allow us to kind of push back and ensure that the heads of procurement were in keeping their kind of practice up to date, but at least in line with guidelines. It's possibly a little too late now because, as you say, the new tender for the framework is going to come out fairly soon. 
but if there's any way of feeding back into that before the tender comes out, that they should do it in a similar way to the GCloud framework, where you have a new iteration, usually at least once a year. So that if you've missed out, it's only a year before you can get onto it again. So it's not a, a complete new framework, but people can apply, you know, once a year, and that, then more people can come on. Because that way, if you don't get onto it now, it's four years before you can apply again. If there was an iteration each year, then all right, we might have missed out, but at least you can get onto it in a year's time, and it's not four years before you can get onto it. But it would be trying to feed that into their tender before they put the tender out. Yeah, yeah, which, as I said, I mean, if we made it end of the year, we might actually have that time. Well, yeah, if, if nothing else, you know, Visa were to write to them, to Scottish Girl now, to say, you know, one of the issues that come up in this meeting is this, is it possible that working with the British government, GCAP framework, they do the situation, is it possible that you could build that into it so that if people miss out on day one because a brand new company starts up in six months time, at least then they've got a chance to get onto it. Certainly, and I think, it, you know, I've said that we had the support of um, one of the, MS, the new MSPs in the Parliament, a man called Jeremy Balfour, and sometimes when Bisa right or any of us right, we get nowhere when a politician puts their name to a bit of paper, they respond. And actually, that may be another way. So, we're kind of just you know, utilizing the support that we do have for having this, you know, kind of flexible framework. So, that could be, you know, I, I think it's probably right that Bisa right in the first instance, but if we don't get anywhere quickly, actually, let's kind of utilize the networks that we have. In some ways, it might not feel like we've done all much over the last year, and I can I can understand your feelings in that because your ability to make sales hasn't materially changed. We've learned a huge amount, and we understand the landscape, and we know who to speak to, and we've got you know um, we've got a picture of kind of the partial picture of local authorities. So I don't I feel that there, there is a lot has been made to help you make sales, and I think the point around the material for learning festival would be particularly useful. So I don't want you to feel like the kind of work that we tried to do on your behalf over last year hasn't been worth well. I think it has, it has helped support you. I certainly hope whatever course that BISA takes over the next six to 12 months would make an even greater change. And certainly the relationships start to build with um, Scott Lakefell and others, I think, can be built upon. I'm obviously anxious to make sure that we don't miss the tender coming out again. Yes. We're on, we get all the emails <laughs> and everything else that we should. So is Obviously, it's a few years since we set the whole thing up, so they've just been coming through and you get requests. So it tender. comes through Public Contract Scotland, so that's where that's where it will be uploaded and available, and you'll get your notification. It's certainly worth checking your registration through Public Contract Scotland as an individual company, so that we can provide kind of. As long as that's all there. That, that's. I mean, that's certainly that's absolutely where it comes through, and that's to give. Obviously, it's the the national procurement kind of website, so it, it all kind of national contracts will go up and that so everybody has an equal opportunity. Um, but at least I've caught, you certainly haven't missed it. That's, you know, you're very, very far away from missing it. I'm not sure at this point how long your window will be to apply and the kind of quote, what they're expecting from it. So obviously that, that's, and I'm, I, I don't believe Scotland Excel are very clear on that at this point either. But certainly I, when I spoke with them yesterday, they said get in touch in two weeks and I'll hopefully give you an indicative timeline about the process and I'm, I'm certainly can share it, Caroline can pass that out to yourselves um, about what that would look like so I'll give you an idea about when to particularly look for that notice when it comes up. Okay well thank you very much for listening mostly and participating and hopefully uh, <coughs> excuse me give you an idea about what we've done and make you get a bit of buy-in about actually what BISA can and should be doing over the next 6-12 months so thank you very much. <laughs>